hello, hello. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I just found this out 20 seconds ago that Clint's mom is here. Where are you, mom? Where are you, mom? <laughs> ah, there she is. Of course, I was going to embarrass you in front of your mom, who I'm sure is very proud of you um, for everything you've accomplished. And of course, all that you uh, have added to this wonderful discussion. Who doesn't love a list? I love a list. The whole point of a list is to fight over the list, I think. And The Atlantic <laughs> um, has put out a tremendous list, the great American novels, uh, looking at the last 100 years and the best novels. And what I really love about it is you didn't feel pressure to give in to a number. Because a lot of people, will, it's very easy to go 100 greatest novels in the last 100 years or something like that. But this is a very uneven, awkward <laughs> 136. <laughs> and um, if you all haven't, uh, please make sure that you get one of these trusty cards here that I think is brilliant and genius because it has a little checkbox in them so you can check off uh, all the novels you've read. You can look at how far you have to go. And um, even though I'm a career journalist, it really made me feel quite stupid filling that out because I was just like, <laughs> Oh my God, there's so much I haven't read. Uh, but do make sure that you get one of those. And more importantly, there's a QR code that's on the back page and you can read the article, the explanation. You can see the, you know, the, the digital version of the list itself. So make sure that you check that out so you can uh, further participate in this wonderful discussion. Uh, we're gonna get this started. Um, I'm so excited to discuss this because I know there was a lot of debate. It, dropped online today. People are already arguing about it, which I love for you all, because <laughs> my name isn't on it, so y'all got to argue with them. <laughs> but I, I, I want to start off, um, and Jane, I'll start with you, but I want you, you all to, everybody to answer. Uh, to me, the debate over a list, before you debate it, you have to know what are the parameters. And I like for you all to discuss what do you think makes a great American novel? So let's start with sort of the criteria. So Jane, you can, you can go first with that one. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Good to be here. Um, so I think one way that I can talk about it is um, to start with the name. Um, the, the phrase that we used, great American novels, um, you might have a picture of what that looks like in your head. It's a, an often used phrase. Um, and we sort of wanted to play with that to maybe, you know, make it a little bit unpredictable, um, to sort of deepen that, to, to widen it, to maybe subvert what you think a great American novel is. Um, so we thought a lot about how to make that feel capacious. Um, in terms of qualities that we were looking for, I would say, um, you know, it has to have superlative craft, right? The writing has to be extremely good and original. Um, I think unique voice, um, some kind of a, a narrator or a voice that is just transporting you somewhere, doing something that feels um, wildly different. Um, and, um, and then I think, you know, even just looking at the structure of a novel, um, novels that are doing something that feel interesting and different. So, you know, if they're playing with the form of the novel, if they're sort of structuring their story in ways that feel new and fresh. Um, so I think those are a few that come to mind for me. I'm curious if others have other thoughts. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add to that is that we were also interested in novels that have big ideas. So those don't just need to be big ideas about war and peace and the nature of human existence. Those can also be big ideas about relationships and family life. So, you know, big ideas about domestic topics. But we wanted to make sure that we were looking at novels that said something profound about what it is to be alive, in addition to being lovely to read. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing that I appreciate about so many of the novels on this list is they really are emblematic of the idea that there is universality in the granular. I think these are so many of these books, I'd say almost all of these books are books that are not attempting to be the great American novel in the, in the sense that they are attempting to tell an overarching American story um, as if there is a single American story, right? I think what they're doing, so many of them are being very specific, being very granular, 
excavating the specific experiences of different groups of people, different individuals within specific regions, within specific communities, and from those novels, um, and from those characters in very specific places, in small towns, um, in big cities, and everything in between, I think what the reader experiences and what I've experienced reading so many of these books is uh, a relationship to the characters and the ideas and the themes that exist and are animated by the way that they move through the story and, and what the um, story is wrestling with that, that I think are um, speak to the characters' experiences, but in doing so speak to a broader set of ideas that are, as Ellen said, like tied to the human experience. Um, and, and I think that that's one of the really important qualities of a book that succeeds in this way is that it's not trying to be everything to everybody, but it's, it's trying to tell the story of a very particular person or a par very particular group of people, um, and in doing so tells a story that speaks to the sort of larger human condition. Uh, while I have you on the hook, let me also <laughs> ask you, why do you think it's important for us to still believe in the great American novel? For me, the, the beauty of the great American novel, almost kind of, you know, alluding to what I said before, is that there are so many different strains of Americanness, right? Like, I think we are incredibly unique in the history of the world in that we are attempting to build a multicultural, racially diverse democracy and to have that um, project succeed in ways that it hasn't historically succeeded. succeeded. Um, and, and I think that having books that reflect the multiplicity, the plurality, uh, the complexity of the American story, um, that reflect the things that we should be proud of as well as the things that we should be ashamed of. Um, and that tried to tell all of those stories. Again, not that one book is going to tell all those stories within itself, but I think one of the great things about a list like this is that it, you have so many stars that make up the constellation of what is America. Um, and I, I think that together these create, like, um, it's almost as if all of these books together are the great American novel, so to speak. Um, but you need all of them. They're all parts of the whole. Um, so, so I would say that there's not a single novel that is the great American novel, but the assemblage of all of these authors, all of these stories together um, reflect the complexity, reflect the American project in ways that uh, I think are really powerful and unique. Uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Ellen. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just going to say that as part of this project, I did some research into the history of the term Great American Novel, which had sort of been in my brain forever, but I didn't know where it came from. And it turned out that it was proposed um, by a writer, John William DeForest, right after the Civil War. And, you know, this was a moment when the concept of America seemed so fragile. And he was proposing a kind of new American art form, uh, something that could unite the country, um, his, his phrase, which I love, was a, a novel that could paint the soul of America, paraphrasing a little bit. But I find that so, like that was kind of a North Star for this. Um, and I think to Clint's point, all of these novels together, they're so different. You know, we have tiny little novellas and we have long opuses or opi, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, someone fact check me on that. Um, you know, we have so many different kinds of books, but together I do think they paint the soul of America. So Ellen, take us deeper um, into the process because uh, you know, what was the inspiration behind this? Uh, how did you go, how did you all go about like, okay, this is how we want to decide what belongs on this list? Yeah, so, you know, the inspiration for this was that we talk a lot at The Atlantic and just in the world of people who love books about greatness. And we wanted to really think deeply and in a concrete way about what that means and sort of pressure test some of our assumptions about what we're talking about when we're talking about literary greatness. So that's kind of where the sort of intellectual impetus for this project came. The way we did it was we, um, we went to experts, meaning um, subject matter experts, a lot of scholars, 
professional critics, so people who just read all the time for work, and then authors of novels uh, we admire. And we asked them what they would put on this list. We put all of those in a Google Doc, um, along with our own internal recommendations, um, created this spreadsheet that like truly like crashed my computer every time I tried to open it. It was very long. And we just systematically went through. We really wanted to be rigorous. I, I don't know how many hours Jane and I and some of our colleagues spent talking about these books, but we wanted to examine each of them and really talk about what makes them great if they are great. And so we kind of eventually just kept whittling down and whittling down and whittling down until we landed on a number that felt complete. Yeah, I was gonna say, how did you know, okay, it's 136, as opposed to 140 <laughs> or 142 or? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question. Um, we weren't aiming for 136 before. We knew we, we didn't want to land on an arbitrary number for no reason. It, it kind of drives me a little crazy when I read a list that's the top 100 of something just because I, I'm desperate to know what was 101. <laughs> um, but so we decided that we would just keep going until the list felt complete. And at some point, we just got to a place where it felt complete. We didn't feel like we were missing anything. We sat on it for a while. We sort of let it marinate. We talked to people that we work with who hadn't been as deeply involved with the project just to make sure that we didn't miss anything huge. And after a while, this, this list of 136 just felt right. Well, um, I felt good because my favorite book is on here. I can't speak for y'all, but... Uh, <laughs> What's your favorite book? Uh, Their Eyes Were Watching God. That's my favorite book of all time, so very happy with that, yes. Um, made the list. But not everybody's fave made the list. And uh, as I mentioned, the piece uh, dropped um, on the Atlantic's website today. Uh, you all can check it out. But already you're hearing some feedback. So, so far, <laughs> what has been the biggest debate that has come out of it? What, it, what are the naysayers saying about, it's <laughs> already complaining about with this list? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, this list is subjective. Just saying that out loud, it's subjective. You know it's gonna be good if you hit us with the qualifier first. <laughs> <laughs> um, the biggest debate that people are having about this list is about the omission of To Kill a Mockingbird, which is a book we Ooh. talked about a lot. We didn't forget about it. We talked about it and, you know, we wanted to be really rigorous and we wanted to not be too dutiful about this list. We didn't just wanna copy paste from school syllabi around the country and call it a day. We wanted to really consider whether these books stand the test of time. It turns out a lot do, you know, we have Gatsby and Their Eyes Were Watching God and Faulkner and Steinbeck and some of the classics that a lot of us read as teens. But with To Kill a Mockingbird, we re-examined it and we felt like it just didn't hold up. Uh, and I, I don't mean that it's, politics don't like perfectly map onto the politics of 2024. What I mean is that we felt like there were other novels that were exploring the themes that Lee was exploring. So, you know, duty and family and justice and race and goodness, but we're doing it in a more sophisticated way. Um, you know, I just, ultimately we felt like, and we talked about it for a long time, we felt like it was not quite as successfully doing the thing it was trying to do as other books that are out there. I know this is a controversial opinion. You can find <laughs> me later and argue with me. Uh, but I would say that's the biggest debate. I don't know, Jane, if you've seen anything else. There have been some other, um, other things that people have taken up exception to. I think some folks have, um, like one sort of strand of argument has been why this novel rather than that novel from the author. Um, and you know, I think we've seen that with um, probably with uh, maybe with Updike, Updike, maybe Highsmith as well. Yeah, um, Highsmith. We went for a sort of a less well-known Highsmith. Uh, for Pinchon as well, uh, we we chose Crying of Lot Forty Nine rather than Gravity's Rainbow. <laughs> um, uh, a couple of others like that, and I yeah. think in those kinds of situations, we also talked those out. You know, we, we as Ellen mentioned, we, you know, had uh, our experts, you know, folks that, you know, were recommending um, books that they felt were, um, 
the ones that we should we should include. And you know, in the course of conversation, sometimes we went for a slightly unexpected pick, um, something that felt like it would just uh, add to the mix in a, in a, in a way that felt um, uh, yeah, just a little fresher. Um, and then in some cases, we just thought they were better. Um, and you know, we'll we'll just have to fight about it if if there is a little bit um, of disagreement on that front. But well, that's I'm glad, part of the beauty of it too, right? I'm glad you brought that up about how in some cases you didn't necessarily include maybe the book the author is most well known for. Um, like we were discussing backstage about how Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eyes is not on this book, is not on this list, but there are several other of her books that are. Um, Clint, you went with Giovanni's Room in Another Country by James Baldwin uh, in terms of putting them on this list. I mean, obviously for a lot of people, that's maybe not the first book that comes to mind with James Baldwin. So was that something that you wrestled with? And, and just give us some insight about how you arrived at that decision. Yeah, I mean, one of the things about so many of these writers is that many of them weren't just novelists. Like many of them were short story writers, many of them were essays, many of them were journalists. Um, and so Baldwin is somebody who, for many of us, is known more so for his essays than he is for his novels. Um, but he wrote plays, he wrote novels, he wrote poems, he wrote um, short stories. And, and so, you know, one of the reasons that I thought it was important to have Giovanni's Room here is because, uh, one, it's just, I think it's an excellent novel um, and, and reflects the uh, quality of prose that we find in um, Baldwin's essays, but you know, transported into uh, into fiction, and it also I think reflects the the courage of Baldwin. Um, Baldwin's publisher, when Baldwin said that he was going to write Giovanni's Room, and he went to his publisher um, and told them what it was about about two two men um, in love and what their relationship was like. His publisher said that they weren't going to publish it, and they said that this is going to ruin your career. You're going to alienate. Um, all of your readers, you are somebody who is supposed to write about race, you write about black people and, and, uh, and white people, and um, you should st basically stay in your lane. Like, don't, um, don't write about this thing that, again, in, in the 1960s, uh, 1950s, um, was, uh, was really risky and wasn't, obviously was not um, a part of our social and collective discourse in the way that it is now. Uh, but he refused, and so he published that book with a different publisher than his original publisher. Um, and I think it, he also rejected the idea that his lane was writing about race, because Baldwin was a queer man, and he was like, this is a part of me, this is a part of the human experience, the human condition, um, that is not reflected in American literature in ways that are commensurate with the experiences of the millions of queer people who live here who may not necessarily you know, be able to say that they are, um, that they are queer in you know the 1950s and 1960s, but uh, but that it reflects a part of their experience um, in America and and beyond, because obviously the book is set um, not even in America, it's set in France. But I think it just was something that reflected a part of Baldwin's larger project um, that isn't always accounted for. Um, like we talk about his letter to his nephew, we talk about. Um, you know, his uh, incredible oratory skills. Um, but he was also like a really, it, it, it also reflects a different part of his, um, a different iteration of his skill set. Um, because it's not polemic, it's not uh, fiery, um, it is really exploring the sort of soft interiority of so many of these, uh, these characters whose, whose lives have not always, again, been taken seriously in, in the form of the novel previously. Uh, for those who don't know, Clint is actually from here. Um, he's from New Orleans. And one of the books that is on the list uh, writes to an experience that you know all too well um, about Hurricane Katrina, because that was something that you experienced when you were in high school. Uh, Jessamine Ward's uh, Salvage the Bones. Jessamine and I will be having a conversation after this panel, so please do stick around for that to talk about Salvage the Bones and, and other works. Uh, that novel made the list. Um, for you being from here, talk about that novel and why it is important that something like that be represented on a list like this one. Yeah, I mean, so that's one of the more recent novels on the list um, uh, that was published in 2011. Uh, and if you haven't read um, Salvage the Bones, um, it is my, you know, Jasmine Ward is one of our great, great American novelists um, in the history of, of American writing. 
um, and, and so you're incredibly lucky to be able to hear from her today. And, you know, Salvage the Bones, it, similar to what Baldwin did in the context of two queer men, part of what Jesmond does in Salvage the Bones is take the lives of, like, southern Mississippi teenagers and, like, render them so full and so complex um, and so human in ways that, again, like, southern black teenagers um, are not always presented. Um, and, and it really pushes back, and again, not in a polemic way, not in a didactic way, not in a preachy way, but, and, and I think this is the power of what a novel can do, is that it can illuminate the humanity of people in a different part of the world, in a different part of the country, uh, people who you might not otherwise engage with and interact with you know, on a daily basis. Um, and, and present their lives as being so rich and so, um, again, complicated in the ways that all of our lives are. And in doing so, you know, you don't have to be a 13-year-old girl in southern Mississippi in order to understand the protagonist of that story, in order to resonate with the protagonist of that story, because something about that young girl speaks to something inside of all of us. Um, and I think that that book is sort of exemplary in the way that um, in the way that it does that. Yeah, as you mentioned, it's a newer book, and I think that's also one of the beauties of this list, is that it is very inclusive regarding, you know, error, genre, um, you know, new, old. Uh, and Jane, I want to ask you this, um, along those same lines, you know, with the newer books, because you have, like, The Sympathizer by uh, Via Tang Nguyen, um, Nevada, Imogene Benny. Um, just give us some insight in, about the approach and the thought process behind adding some of the more newer novels to a list like this. This was actually one of the hardest parts of coming up with the, this list because we didn't want to over-index on, you know, recent novels that we'd all read and were excited about. <clears throat> um, but we also wanted to make sure that, you know, uh, we had good representation um, from the more recent novels on, um, that, have, that have been published, of which there are so many great ones. Um, and so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and so, you know, we really did talk about it a lot. And, you know, I think the, the way we ended up thinking about it was um, what are the ones that are gonna, like, last in our memories? Like, what are the ones that really feel like, you know, they're already on their way to becoming some form of a new classic um, in whatever way that might be, and it might be different for a different kind of book. Um, and so, you know, something like The Sympathizer, um, I think it's a really good example of a novel that is taking a really big, again, talking about like big ideas, like it took, you know, Vietnam War, which had, you know, often been written about in a certain way, and just flips it, right, and, talk, and, and writes about it from a completely different perspective, and not just, you know, uh, a Vietnamese narrator, but, you know, this is a North Vietnamese mole in a South Vietnamese army, then after the war, you know, continues to embed in a South Vietnamese community in the States in exile. Um, and it's, you know, like, what, what does it mean to be both sort of a mole and, and an immigrant? You know, like, there, there's, there's a lot that's really interesting. It's, it's fascinating to, to sort of see the layers in the book. And, you know, it kind of speaks to the fractured consciousness and the sort of fractured identity that a lot of, um, you know, recent immigrants uh, might feel. And, you know, it speaks to, uh, the, you know, a, a lot of that, a lot of the sorts of questions of identity and belonging, um, but in a way that felt super um, different. Um, and so, you know, like we, we thought about what some of those things could be when, when we were looking at these books. Um, and something like Nevada, just really quickly, like, I mean, Imogen Binney is, you know, she's a young, a young writer. Um, this book came out in, in I want to say, like the 2010s, and um, tiny, tiny press, um, and then went quickly out of print. And then the fans kept it alive, and then it just got picked up by a slightly bigger press, and you know, got reissued. And it's, you know, it, it's an, it's an early, it's, it's a, a new classic of trans literature. Um, you know, we, we have a trans protagonist um, who is instantly memorable. Um, you just don't want to stop hanging out with her. It's just really fun. She's, you know, she's snobby and like annoying and cranky, but also just really charismatic. And you know, you just kind of want to like be there on the journey with her. 
Um, and so that kind of like, mem like th that sort of feeling of I'm gonna remember this um, was, you know, again, subjective, but part of our decision-making process, I would say. All right, well, let's, give, get, uh, let's get even more suggest, uh, subjective. Um, I'm gonna ask each of you to name the one book that if you had magical powers that you could put in everyone's hand from this list. And uh, Ellen, I'll start with you. <laughs> Thanks, Jamel. I know. Um, uh, I, so I gave you the easy ones because I like you. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are many books on this list that I wish everyone, I could just kind of like put in everyone's brain, but the one I will talk about is Mumbo Jumbo by Ishmael Reed, which I hadn't read before this project, um, but I'd heard of and I picked it up in the course of researching this project and ended up writing about it, writing a blurb about it for the list. It is this like very richly textured, I describe it as a collage in my write-up and it really feels that way. It starts as a like a movie script and it contains like original artwork and uh, you know, there are parts of it that are like a newspaper and it has footnotes and it sort of is doing kind of like that really rich like you know, metafictional thing relatively early, but it it just also has this amazing plot. It's about um, this virus that is sweeping the nation. <laughs> Stop me if you've heard this one before. The, vi the symptoms of this virus are like wild dancing and laughter and appreciation of black culture. And the establishment in the novel is so freaked out by this. And it's sort of about, um, it's imagining this, this, you know, world where there are all kinds of conspiracy theories about it and there are all kinds of people who are trying to figure out what's going on, but it's rendered in this really unforgettable way where there's just so much in it. You know, he incorporates, like, the entire history of religion and he incorporates, um, you know, Egyptology and he goes down these tangents and it's just so fun to get to spend some time in his brain. So if you haven't read Mumbo Jumbo, you should pick it up. I mean, for a second, that sounded like the plot of Footloose. I was like, where are we going with this? <laughs> yeah, it Footloose actually, is actually based on Mumbo Jumbo. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it all makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Jane, what, what's your one book? This is really hard, but um, I'm going to pick a recent one since I'm going down that lane anyway. Um, uh, Nothing to See Here by Kevin Wilson um, is a book that is just, it's, it's very simple in a way, um, and you know, it's, it has a sort of un unbelievable conceit. Um, these two, this young woman um, sort of becomes the caretaker for these two young kids who when they're upset about something or when they're feeling emotional just burst into flames. And the way that Wilson just takes this unrealistic scenario and treats it with such care um, and gives us very realistic solutions to kids bursting into flames is just, it's really lovely to, <laughs> to, to, to read, read and follow along. And, and ultimately, it's a story about how to take care of each other. And so, you know, it's this, it's this story about found family. It's um, entertaining. It is, um, you know, a, a book that honestly, like I read like in a day, you know, it was, it was a quick read, but I keep talking about it and I'll <laughs> keep talking about it on the stage, I guess. So um, I think that would be my pick. I would say, I'll pick another recent one, uh, The Namesake by Jhumpa Lahiri. Um, I'm like the president of the Jhumpa Lahiri <laughs> fan club. Um, I just, every single one of her books is incredible to me. It's interesting because it reflects someone who, almost, to some people, is more well-known for her short stories. I mean, Interpreter of Maladies, uh, she won the Pulitzer Prize for it when she was like 32. Um, and, but, you know, like many of her, much of her work, it is exploring the experience of, um, Indian immigrants to, uh, and South Asian immigrants to the uh, United States and the sort of tension between the, uh, the parents and then the kids who are born here uh, and how do the kids think about what they carry and the lineage they carry from abroad uh, while also attempting to assimilate into a sort of um, understood quintessential Americanness and like what is Americanness, what version of that are they trying to assimilate into? Um, and I think it's reflective of what I was saying before about how, like, I'm not an immigrant, I'm not South Asian, and yet these books, like, speak 
to me in ways that are just so um, profound and so remarkable, and I'm so grateful for them. I also want to say, uh, before our time <laughs> is up, you might be like, man, 136 novels, that's too much. Like, that's sweet, Atlantic, but no thanks. Um, <laughs> but I did the math. Let's say, so there's 136 novels. Let's say, on average, 400 pages. So that's 54,400 pages. Let's say it takes you two minutes to read each page. So that's, I'm not gonna do all the math, but like you go, keep going down 108,800 minutes divided by 60, 1,813 hours. If you read for one hour every day, you can read all of these books in five years. So. Pretty good. It's much more manageable than you think. <laughs> All right, well, here's some other stats, not as fun as that one. Uh, Pen America study found 3,300 books were banned in the 2022-2023 school year, which was a 33% increase from the previous school year. 44% of the novels that are on this Atlantic list have been banned in some capacity. Uh, so among the many reasons why this list is so important is that it is another opportunity for us to keep this alive and to think very seriously about what these book bans are doing to the future of storytelling and education. Um, we'll actually continue more uh, discussion on that with Jessmine in a minute, but I wanted to thank you all for joining us. Read the list, you have the QR code. One hour a day, people, you can read <laughs> all of these books in five years. A warm round of applause for our panelists. Thank you, Clint, Jane, Ellen. Thank you, Clint's mama. We appreciate you as well. <laughs> Good night, everybody.